little bit from this book. We're in the point of view here of um, Archie Stallings. He's one of the main characters, and he's had kind of a hard day by this point already. He's looking for a little consolation. He just found out today that, among many other surprising revelations, that a big, uh, like a sort of a mega mini mall uh, is going to be moving two blocks in two blocks away from his record store that he co-owns, and it's going to have this huge used vinyl department, and they're going to be crushed, or so he fears. So he's, um, he's looking for some consolation. 41st was all sky and wires and broken roof lines and like a lot of streets that had been cut in two by the construction of the Grove Shafter Freeway. After all these years, it still had a dazed feel. A man who had taken a blow to the head, staggering hatless down from telegraph, face planting at the overpass. Archie felt a balloon of failure inflating in his ribcage. Between the days of peewee carousels and hectic stolen packages of ding-dongs, and this afternoon in the wasteland of the Golden State grocery parking lot, which is where the, the new store is going to be built, there seemed to lie an unbridgeable gulf. As if his history were not his own, but the history of someone more worthy of it, someone who had not betrayed it. He felt for the first time, not for the first time today, that he had not made a good decision in his personal or professional life since 1989. <laughs> We're in 2004 here. <laughs> when he had accepted an impromptu one-night invitation to play a funkadelic show at the Warfield. Archie was, at that time, a member of a P-Funk tribute band called Bop Gun. <laughs> I should have actually since been informed that that George Clinton was not performing as Funkadelic in 1989. He was performing as the P-Funk All-Stars, so I got that wrong. <laughs> uh, he in accepted this invitation to play a Funkadelic show at the Warfield after Boogie Mawson was laid up with a case of food poisoning. That was no decision at all, since a request from George Clinton was an incontrovertible voice from the top of a very high mountain. Archie was tired of Nat, his partner, and he was tired of Gwen, his wife, and of her pregnancy, with all the unsuspected depths of his insufficiency that it threatened to reveal. <laughs> he was tired of Brooklyn, and of black people, and of white people, and of all their schemes and grudges, their frontings, hustles, and corruptions. Most of all, he was tired of being a holdout, a sole survivor, the last coconut hanging on the last palm tree, on the last little atoll, in the path of the great wave of late modern capitalism, <laughs> waiting to be hammered flat. He followed 41st as it bent around to run into 42nd, then turned right and found himself, speaking of soul survivors and the fatal path of the tsunami, in front of Neldum's Bakery. <laughs> a lint-bearded geezer of the type known in Archie's childhood as a wino sat on an overturned milk crate just beyond the entrance, making his way with evident contentment through a sack of Swedish rolls. <laughs> Pretty good rolls, Archie remembered. The wino stopped chewing and looked at Archie, his expression bleary but somehow astute, most likely trying to decide whether Archie was trying to menace or catch a roll off him. This here my lunch, he said apologetically. Breakfast, too. I've no intention to molest your lunch, brother, Archie said. I was always a dream of cream man myself. <laughs> when he was a boy, a dream of cream from Neldum's crumbly chocolate cake, interglaciating flows and tundras of whipped cream, the outside armored in a jagged tectonics of wide chocolate shavings. <laughs> I've never had a visual aid before. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Was a prodigy, a work of wonder, five dollars no one could spare spent annually by stingy but cake-loving ladies <laughs> to celebrate the coming into the world of a fatherless and motherless